that's it. You should be able to define taxation. You should also be able to tell the various types of taxes and the forms of tax. Again, you should be able to explain the key tenants of a good and functioning tax system. You should also be able to explain the role or the significance of taxation in any economy. Also, you should be able to explain the term incidence of tax. Finally, you should be in a position to tell the various sources of taxes, both primary and secondary. These are the reading list that will facilitate your understanding of this lesson. Can you ensure that you have copies of these reading materials? Now, the very first issue to be considered here is for us to appreciate what tax is all about. We need to be clear in our mind what tax is. Now, in order for you to understand what tax is, there are some key points you should note. The first point is that tax is a compulsory payment leveled on persons and businesses. Secondly, it is leveled on the income, consumption, and properties that individuals and businesses have. The third point is that taxes can only be leveled by government or any other authorized agent of government. To that end, individuals are not in a position to impose tax. Rather, it is the government that has the authority to impose tax. Now, to put all together, you would say that when you talk about tax, it's a compulsory payment that is levied on the income, consumption, and properties of individuals, corporations. Corporations here are businesses. Every year, normally, by government. Now, the tax, first of all, as explained, is imposed on the income of business or persons. Secondly, taxes are imposed on goods and services. When you sell goods or provide a service, you earn income. Such income may be subjected to tax. Again, when you hold property or sell off a business asset, it may come with some tax implications, and therefore you may be required to pay tax on such properties that you have sold or probably you hold. Again, as mentioned here, it is only government authorized agents that can levy or enforce tax. In Ghana, the authority to impose tax lies with Ghana Revenue Authority and payment must be made to them. The last point which we've already explained is that taxes are imposed on individuals and corporations or businesses. So these are key points you should note when explaining tax. It cannot be an optional payment, it cannot be levied by individuals themselves. Rather, they are imposed by government and they are compulsory payment. For what? The income or your consumption. And also for holding certain properties. Generally, you can say that payment of tax are on various items. Now the tax may be imposed on any of these. One, the income of household. So your personal income that you may have 
and you need to pay tax on your personal income. Secondly, it may be on your consumption, the goods that you consume. So we have consumer expenditure, i.e. we have that as an example of tax imposition. So you pay tax on the goods you consume. Again, businesses upon receipt from sales, which give them income, are required to pay taxes. Also, from your employment, if you are engaged and you receive income from your employment, such income may also be subjected to tax. Also, companies would have to pay tax on the profits that they make at the end of the year. So business profits or company profit will be subjected to tax. And that is what we call the corporate income tax. Again, dividends are also subjected to tax. And dividends are the benefit that shareholders get at the end of the year. So when you have shares in a company at the end of the year, the company may elect to do portions of their profit to the shareholders. Now that dividend is your income from your investment in the company. And therefore, such income may be subject to tax. Again, tax is imposed on properties. So for holding a property, you would have to pay your property tax. Communication service tax, which is imposed on the telcos, so for any call that you make, there may be an imposition of tax on the amount paid. And also for your internet usage, those taxes are part of the services cost that you pay. Again, when you import goods and you export, there are elements of tax that you have to pay for. So you have import duties, and all of that, which we will explain as we move on with the discussion. So tax may come from different angles. It may be imposed on several things, from your income, to the profits you hold, to the profit you get from your business, and all other income that are eligible for purposes of tax payment. Now, how do we classify tax? There are various classifications for tax. One, you can classify tax according to who levies the tax. Two, tax may be classified based on what it is what tax, what is being taxed. The next one is to classify tax as either direct or indirect. Tax can also be classified based on the variations in the rates. It may be progressive, regressive, or proportional. It may also be on the basis of the method of payment. Now let's go to the fine details of these classification. The first one we would want to look at is what makes a tax a direct one or an indirect tax. Now when you say tax is direct, it means that it is levied on the income or profit of the person who pays it, rather than the goods or service. To that extent, it will be difficult for the person to transfer the tax to another person. Example of such tax is the tax that you pay on your employment income. So if you are fully employed and at the end of the month, you are paid, your salary will be subjected to tax and it is imposed based on your income. And that cannot be transferred to another person. Therefore, we say such a tax is a direct tax because it's imposed on the income of the one paying it. Again, companies profit may be subjected to tax. Now company A cannot shift that tax to company B. And therefore that is a direct tax to company A. So corporate tax 
is also a direct tax. So the key factor in explaining a direct tax is the fact that it is levied on the income or profit of the one paying and therefore cannot be transferred onto another person. But let's look at the indirect tax. When we say a tax is indirect, it means that that tax is not levied on your income or on your profit, but rather it is levied as part of the goods and service that you consume. And therefore, if you do not consume the goods, but rather sell it off, then you can be successful in passing off the tax to the final consumer. And therefore, we refer to it as an indirect tax. So any tax that is transferable because it's, it's charged on the goods and service is referred to as an indirect tax. You can decide to buy a phone for a thousand CDs. That phone may include some taxes. Now, if you decide not to use the phone, but rather sell the phone, you have been successful at transferring the tax to the final consumer. And this is because the tax imposed is not on your income or profit, but rather on the goods. So it is possible for you to transfer if you don't finally consume that goods or service. Example of such indirect tax is what we call value-added tax, which in short is referred to as VAT, VAT. And we have National Health Insurance Levy. We also have the Ghana Education Trust Fund Levy, the Guest Fund Levy, and also Communication Service Tax. These are imposed on goods and services. It means that you only have to cater for the tax if you consume that goods or service. If you do not consume the goods or service, you do not have to incur the tax. So that's the clear difference between direct tax and indirect. Direct taxes are imposed on income and profit of the person paying it. But rather, indirect taxes are imposed on goods and services. So it's only those who consume those goods and services that would have to bear the tax. All right, let's go to other forms of indirect tax. We have special petroleum tax. We have custom and excise tax. We have import duties. These are all taxes imposed on certain goods and services. So you only impair the tax if you consume the good or the service. Now let's look at the collection method. Tax collection is necessary to ensure revenues are collected to fund governmental services or activities. Remember that government will need these taxes for their activities. Now, the mode that you choose in the collection of tax is also very important in classifying the tax. Now, the Income Tax Act 2015, Act 896, which is the main law that govern the administration of tax in Ghana. When you look at section 113 to section 116, it prescribes three methods for tax collection. One, through withholding. Two, through installments. And finally, through assessments. So DRA, which is the main body recognized for the imposition of taxes and administration of tax may authorize an agent to withhold tax and then pay to DRA. That's one way of collecting the tax. So an authorized agent may have the right to withhold the tax and then make onward payments to DRA or Ghana Revenue Authority. Or it may be by installment. So companies may have the option 
they are taxed on installment basis and not wait to the end of the accounting year. It could also be on assessment. On assessment to mean that GRA may have to look at your activities and then determine how much you are liable to pay based on their computations. And then you would have to make your payment thereof. So these are the various ways of collecting taxes in Ghana. Now, you can also classify tax by mode of imposition. There are three main types of taxes. If you look at the mode in which it is being imposed, the first one is referred to as a progressive tax. When you say a tax system is progressive, what we mean is that as your income increases, you pay more tax, not just in absolute terms, but in proportionate terms, you pay higher rate of tax than before. It therefore suggests that if you earn 10,000 cities and your tax rate is about 20%, if the tax system is progressive, you may pay more than the 20% if you earn more than the 10,000, so if your salary increases from 10,000 to 20,000, your 20% 20 tax rate may increase to 30%. And the reason for such a progressive tax is to make sure that the rich pays more than the poor. So the more the income you earn, the higher your tax rate. When you look at the pay as you earn, which is the main determinant for income tax from employment, you realize that as your income increases, your rates of tax also increase. You pay more in percentage terms than someone who has a much reduced income then the second one is what we call the regressive tax system with a regressive tax system it's more like paying the same amount of tax irrespective of your income so when you look at it in that manner you see that then in proportionate term the one who has higher income is paying less example is this if there's a tax of 50 cities imposed on all employees, irrespective of the income you earn, you realize that the one earning 1,000 cities will be paying higher percentage of his income as tax than the one earning 5,000 cities because they are all paying the same amount in absolute term. So when you do the proportion, you realize that the more you earn, the lower the rates of tax to be paid or the proportion of tax to be paid. And such a tax system is regressive, meaning the poor suffers compared to the rich. Because if you are paying the same tax, irrespective of your income, then that will be a lot of burden on the poor than on the rich. So when you go to any supermarket and you buy, say, a ton of milk, and there's a tax of, say, 50 pesos on it. Now, because that tax is regressive, it does not depend on your income level. So irrespective of your income level, you are all going to pay the 50 pesos tax on the ton of milk. That makes it a regressive tax because the poor will just be paying a small portion of his income as tax. Whilst, sorry, the rich will be paying a small portion of his income as tax, whilst the poor pays a much higher portion of his income as tax. So such taxes are not encouraged because it does not support those who earn less income.
The next one is a proportional tax system. When you say a tax system is proportional, what we mean is that when your income increases by a certain percentage, your tax liability also increases by the same percentage. Irrespective of your income, you are paying the same proportion of your income as tax. So that is a proportional tax system. So we are all paying, say, 10% of our income as tax. In absolute terms, the one who earns more will be paying more. But in proportionate terms, realize that we are all paying the same 10% of our income as tax. Now, from this diagram, you can see clearly the distinction between the three main uh, methods for imposition of what? Tax. Now, for the progressive tax, you can see from the diagram that the more your income, the more your income, the higher the tax rate. As your income increases, you can see that the progressive tax also increases as income increases. So as the income increases, the rate of tax also increases. But when you look at the regressive tax, as your income increases, the rate of tax rather reduces. So someone who earns, someone who earns 1,000 may be paying about 30% as what? As tax rate. Another person who earns more, let's say 10,000, will be paying a lower, when you track it to the tax rate, realize that we'll be paying a lower rate as tax. So you see the inverse relationship between the tax rate and the income because it is regressive. An example is what I gave. If you are paying the same 50 pesos on a tin of milk, irrespective of your income, you realize that the one who earns less is paying a greater rate of his income as tax, whilst the rich is just paying a small rate of his income as what? Tax. And that is the regressive tax. But with the proportional tax system, you realize that irrespective of your irrespective of your income is the same rate that you pay. So if it's 10 percent you all pay 10% of your income. So if your income increases by 20%, your tax rate also goes up by the same rate. Now let's look at some attributes of a good tax system. We have come to the conclusion that taxes are very relevant. But how do you administer tax in a way that makes it efficient and also fair to the citizenry. What are the key characteristics of having a very good tax system? Um, there are four key characteristics of a very good tax system. For any country to boast of a good tax system, it should have these four characteristics. The first one is that it should be equitable. Secondly, it should be economical. It should be convenient. And finally, there should be certainty with respect to tax. Now let's look at these attributes of a good tax system. The first one is certainty. Now for a tax system to be efficient, the taxpayer should be able to reasonably predict how much tax he would pay. It shouldn't be clouded in secrecy there should be enough information that will help the taxpayer to estimate his tax liability with some degree of accuracy so that he knows exactly how much he's likely to pay if his income rises to X level or Y level. Again, it should be economical. Economical to say that 
the government should ensure that the cost of administering tax shouldn't exceed the revenue generated from the tax. Remember, Ghana government has set up a whole machinery for the administration of tax, which is Ghana Revenue Authority. It will cost them to collect tax. But what we are saying is that the cost of administering the tax should not be more than the revenue generated thereof. If you do so, then it is not economical. So make sure that the cost of collecting is not more than the revenue itself generated. So you have to devise convenient ways or efficient ways to collect so that your cost will be minimized. The third point is that any good tax system should be fair to the citizenry. There shouldn't be any biases. If we earn the same salary, we should pay the same tax. There shouldn't be discrimination when it comes to tax payment. So we have, first of all, what we call horizontal equity. People of the same level of income should be made to pay the same level of tax. So there's transparency and there's fairness in the administration of tax. Again, it should be vertically equitable. So people who earn more should pay more, and those who earn less should pay less. So that is a respect of equity. The next point is that the administration of tax should be convenient to the taxpayer. So you should devise convenient means of collecting the tax. Because the tax payment, remember again, there's no direct benefit associated with the payment of tax. And therefore, you should not put the taxpayer in a position where the payment of tax becomes an inconvenience to the person. So you have to typically devise means that will make it easier for the taxpayer to be able to meet his tax commitment. So there should be convenience. So there are online systems where you can file your tax returns, you can easily get access to information. All these things should be there to make it convenient for the taxpayer to be able to meet the tax requirements. Very, very important is you want to run a good tax system. Again, these attributes are further explained by Adam Smith and also OE. CD and also AICPA, they all have what? Agree to the fact that for a tax system to be efficient, it should go or it should have these four key characteristics. So you can further read that for your understanding. Now let's look mainly at what at all is the relevance or the rule that taxes play in the economy. Why should you have taxes in any economy? What is the significance? Now, there are two main reasons or objectives of any tax system. One is to generate revenue. Remember that the government have a lot of activities to undertake and therefore they have to raise revenue. And a key revenue source to any government is through taxation. So taxation will help the government to raise revenue to meet the social obligations of the government, to build infrastructure, to give uh, interventions to the less endowed, and all of that. So government expenditure are enormous. And in order for the government to be able to meet these expenditure items, they need to generate revenue. And tax is a key source of revenue for the government. Another reason for taxation, aside its social relevance, is economic in nature. Now, government can use tax as a tool 
to correct inefficiencies in the system. So government may be a fiscal policy tool that may be used to encourage certain activities within the economy. So if governments would want to encourage certain production, they can use tax as a tool to encourage such production. They may want to give tax incentives to uh, producers of certain products so that such productions may increase. So it may be for economic usage or economic relevance and not just social. So we have these two broad objectives or significance for taxation. Again, government may use it to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. So when you have a progressive tax system, what it means is that you tax the rich more and tax the poor less. And you are doing all these to help bridge the gap between the two. Again, you can tax the rich more, use the revenue generated to develop areas for people who are uh, not within the high earning bracket so that the gap between the rich and the poor may be reduced. So government may use tax as a tool to redistribute income among the public. Again, government can use taxation to control inflation. We all know that inflation may be due to a demand pool one, which means that there's excess liquidity in the economy, people have access to cash, whilst the goods and services available are few. And therefore, they are willing to pay higher prices because there's excess liquidity in the economy for fewer goods. Government can use taxes to absorb the excess liquidity in the system so that inflation can be what? Can be reduced. Again, government can use taxation to support any budget deficit that they may have in order to narrow the fiscal gap. Again, government can use taxation to grow certain key sectors of the economy. So if a Greek is key to the economy, government can use taxation incentives such as holidays, rebates for firms that are into the agricultural sector. And that will help to grow such economies, such sectors of the economy that are relevant for the goal of the government to be achieved. Also, in order to ensure that companies spread across the country, the government may institute tax regimes that will support companies at the regional or even the rural areas. So they get tax rebates. You pay less tax if you situate your company at the rural area or a regional capital rather than the uh, the cities. So government may use tax to be able to redistribute the establishment of companies across the country so that we can have the balance in terms of economic growth within the economy. Currently in Ghana, farmers enjoy a concessionary tax rate of 1% for a period of 5 to 10 years, depending on the nature of farming that you are involved in. Also, government through taxation promote exports. Again, under the current tax laws, companies that are engaged in non-traditional exports would have to pay tax of just about 8%. This is done to encourage the production of the non-traditional exports. The non-traditional exports of goods are goods that are not the normal goods we export, such as cocoa and timber. These are traditional exports. So if you want to encourage 
uh, non-traditional ones, the production and exportation of non-traditional ones, uh, you put in tax systems that would encourage people to move into such production to enjoy from the uh, tax regime that is in place. Also, tax can be used to discourage the importation of certain goods. Now, government can decide to import, impose high taxes on certain goods that it thinks may be uh, inimical to the growth of the economy. So if government deems, let's say, cigarettes to be uh, inimical to our growth, it may impose high tax rate on them. By so doing, the prices of such goods will go up and then people will not be able to afford. So you don't even import because the import duties on such goods may be excessively high. So you can use tax to discourage the importation of certain goods that you do not want uh, within your economy. All right, now let's discuss the incidence of tax. Now, when you talk about incidence of tax, we are referring to who actually suffers from the imposition of tax. So I'm a producer, government has imposed tax. Who actually will suffer? Is it the producer of the goods or the consumer? To what extent can the producer shift the burden onto the consumer? Now, to be able to determine the incidence of tax, you have to know the market within which you operate and whether the goods that you produce are elastic or inelastic. If the goods are elastic, what it means is that a change in your price, because when the tax is imposed, you may have to increase your price. But that increase in price may lead to a more than proportionate change in the quantity demanded. So consumers may reduce your consumption for your, the consumption for your goods and going for another good. So when your good is elastic, it makes it difficult for you to shift the burden onto the consumer. But if the good is inelastic, it means that the consumers are not so much bothered by the increase in price as a result of the tax. And therefore, you may be able to shift a greater portion of the tax to the consumer. So this illustration gives us how the change in price affects the quantity demand. In the first case of elastic, realize that the price increased from 10 to 12, and that led to a 20% increase in the selling price. But that was responded by a significant reduction in the quantity demand. Remember, at this series, the demand was 10 quantities or units. But when the price was increased to 12, you see that the quantity demanded reduced to 5, meaning there was a 50% drop in the quantity demand. That means that you cannot shift all the tax to the consumer, but when you do so, the consumer will do what? Will shift from your product because you have an elastic demand. But look at the second scenario where the demand was inelastic. Realize that, yes, the selling price was increased from 10 to 12 due to the imposition of the tax, which led to a 20% increase in the price. But the demand for the product only dropped by 15%, which is from 10 to 9.5. So that means that the proportionate decrease in the quantity demand was lower than the, uh, the increase in your selling price. You have the unitary elastic, it means that the percentage increase or the proportionate increase in the price leads to the same proportionate increase or decrease in your quantity demand. Okay, so in effect, what we are saying is that it's easier to shift the burden to the consumers if the 
demand for your product is inelastic. In effect, if the demand for the product is perfectly inelastic, you can actually shift all the tax or the burden to the consumer and vice versa. It will also be difficult for you to increase the price if the demand is also perfectly elastic. So perfect inelastic, you can shift the whole burden to the consumer, but if it's perfectly elastic, you cannot increase the price because they will respond and not buy any of your units. But if you are operating within a monopoly, it will be dependent on the shape of the demand and supply caps. That will determine whether you can be able to shift all or even more than the 100% to the consumer. Now let's look at these scenarios. You realize that this was the initial supply curve. You have S, which is the initial supply curve. Now, when the tax was imposed, your supply definitely reduced because now you cannot produce more because of the tax. That increased your cost of operation. So the supply has shifted to the left. Now, what do you see here? You see that at the initial supply cap, the price was at P. But when the supply cap shifted to the left, you saw that you had to increase your price. And that would mean that quantity demand will reduce from Q to Q1. Now, what was the tax imposed? The difference in the two curve tells you the tax imposed from this point to that point. So this was the tax imposed from point this point to that point that was a tax impose that's why you see the supply can shift from s to s plus p but the issue is that you cannot shift all the burden to the consumer so what happens though this is the increase in the price as a result of your the tax so from this point p o Let's name this PO to P1. But because the product is elastic, the demand is elastic, at the new supply unit, the consumers are willing to pay only P1. They are willing to pay P1. But the tax was actually PO to P1, so the whole of this. But they are willing to increase the price from P to P1. So this is the burden on the consumer. Previously, before the tax, the consumer was in P at point P. After the tax was imposed, the consumer is willing to increase it from P to P1. So he is willing to bear only this portion of the tax from P to P1. So the remaining portion, which is PO to P, would have to be borne by the producer. Remember, the tax imposed increased to PO to P1, the whole of this. But the consumer previously was paying P, but after the tax was imposed, it's only willing to increase from P to P1. Meaning he's not taking up all the tax that has been imposed, only a portion. So the remaining portion of PO to P must be borne by the producer. So there's a split in the tax, meaning the producer must bear half of the price, or the tax imposed, and then the consumer also bears the other half of the tax imposed. This is what we refer to as unitary elastic. The producer must share 
the imposition of tax with a consumer. But let's look at a second scenario where it is inelastic. Now, the supply was S, which was at this point, let's say PO, PO, peanut. This was the price at the initial supply, PO. Now, when the tax was imposed, it moved from S to S plus tax. You see the shift to the left because you cannot produce more. So the quantity produced reduced because of the tax. So when the supply reduced, you realize that the selling price now increased to P1 from the original P because originally the demand and supply was at P. But when the tax was imposed, the price that the consumer is now willing to pay is P1, not the previous P before the tax. But remember that the tax actually is from PO to P1 because in between the line in between the two supply curve is the tax that has been imposed. It is actually from the PO to the P1. But the consumer is willing to bear P to P1, which is a greater portion of the tax. And therefore, the producer must bear the remaining portion of the tax, which is from PO to P. And this is only possible when the demand is inelastic. So consumers do not respond in equal measure to the increase in price. Let's look at the next one, which is the elastic one. It means that a small increase in the selling price, consumers will drop their demand. Let's see, at S, the price PO will be here. So they were willing to pay this PO. At the initial supply, the price PO was here. Now, when the tax was imposed, the supply increased to S plus T. So you see, the tax was from P to P1, from P to P1. But because this is elastic, the demand for the product is elastic, you realize that consumers previously were paying P for the product. After the reduction in the supply as a result of the tax imposed, consumers are only willing to pay an extra amount from P to P1, just a small portion, because the demand is elastic. And it means that once you increase the price, consumers will reduce their demand drastically. So the forces of demand and supply will force a certain price. And you see that it's only a small portion of the tax that you can shift to the consumer because if you shift a lot of the tax burden to them, they will also move to another product. So when the demand for the product is elastic, the consumer only bears a small portion of the tax imposed. The producer would have to bear a greater portion of the tax, which is from PO to P. From PO to P. The producer would have to bear that greater portion of the tax. Now, finally, we want to look at the various sources of tax. There are two main sources of tax. You have the primary source and also the secondary source. The primary source of tax is from enactment by an act of parliament, legislation. So we have the Income Tax Act 2015 Act 896 and a number of regulations by parliament. We also have case laws. So from the judicial precedents, some decided cases may become a basis or a law in terms of the practice of taxation. 
Also, we have treaties, and treaties are agreements or arrangements between two nations. So there may be some arrangements that is ratified between two nations, and that may become a source of what? Taxation. Now, these are primary source, original sources of tax. You have secondary sources. So secondary sources are the textbooks. So if you want the original source, they are from the Act, the case laws, and also the treaties. But if you want the secondary source, it's what you have in your textbooks, manuals, journals, bulletins, and articles. So they would more or less summarize what is in the primary and give you the key issues that you may need in the form of a textbook or a manual and all of that. So we have the primary source and the secondary sources of what? Of taxation. Now, in conclusion, these are the key issues that you have to note. Now, the first point you have to note for this lesson is that tax is a compulsory payment and it is levied by the government on the taxpayer. Again, you have to note that government will use tax to finance their expenditure or their activities. So it's a main source of funding for government activities. Again, government may use tax to discourage certain economic situations. So if you want to curb inflation, you want to discourage people from the consumption of certain items that may not benefit the, the country, you may use taxation as a tool to ensure that. Again, generally, taxes provide the funds for public goods and services, such as roads, uh, street lights. These are public goods that you cannot exclude someone from enjoying. So you need the government to step in to provide the roads, uh, security, and all of that. And they need revenue. And the main source of revenue, they have to come from taxation. Finally, taxes are used to redistribute wealth or to create more wealth within the society. So if you have a progressive tax, you may tax the rich more and the poor less so that you redistribute the income fairly within the economy. Now, these are quick quizzes that you should be able to prep yourself with at the end of this session. So kindly go through all these and make sure you're able to answer these questions. This is also a discussion that you have to also go through at the end of this lesson. So this brings us to the end of the very first lesson in taxation. I wish you all the best and I'll see you for the second lesson.